2 exists doesn't commit us to the number 2. We ought to be able to move that way. Um, but then necessarily false sentences is not just that they commit us to everything. It's rather that uh, they don't have determinate ontological commitments at all. Um, at least there's, there's something to be said for, for this uh, line of argument. Uh, it gets still worse. Um, I'm thinking at least it does. Um, so Ryo and other people like that might say, well, we don't really care about necessary false sentences. So maybe we shouldn't just care about true sentences and theories. Maybe we should care about possibly true th sentences and theories. But what about necessarily false theories and sentences? Perhaps we can set those aside, and we can just apply our principle to possibly true sentences and theories. Um, presumably, that's not going to work either. So we have this star principle uh, from the previous slide, namely that necessarily false sentences do not have determinate commitments. Um, and then suppose for reductio that there are chairs and that that determinately commits us to chess. So um, that seems plausible. Let's suppose that that's the case for reductio. Then you might recall the implication principle, which says that the commitments of a sentence implications are among the commitments of the sentence itself. And so by that principle, if we take um, a necessarily false sentence, uh, there are pink numbers and chairs, then it follows that that should determinately commit us to uh, chairs, uh, but that contradicts our first, first premise, the star premise. Uh, that actually wasn't a premise, it was the conclusion of the previous slide. But then by reductio, their chairs does not determinately commit us to chairs, and so basically even what appears to be a true sentence do not have determinate com uh, commitments. Um, so, that seems to disqualify the modal principle. OK, so um, we might, um, well, well, actually, before moving to other principles, uh, let me just um, point out that there are some other counterintuitive or at least unintuitive consequences of the Ryo modal principle. Actually, Ryo does acknowledge some of these consequences. Um, so, so, for instance, suppose we have. Um, necessary instances, numbers um, that exist necessarily, then the, the consequent of the strict conditional will be satisfied. Um, and so it doesn't matter what S is, the sentence uh, is in the first place, so practically any sentence um, is committed to numbers, which seems unintuitive, uh, possibly. Um, consider the sentence. Um, John is sitting now, so if we go Kripkean, uh, then in any world where that is uh, true, uh, John exists. Um, and, on, uh, well, the Kripkean theory, right? So John came from a particular zygote or had a certain origin, uh, which was probably a zygote. And so um, whenever he exists, that would be zygotes in the world. And so John is sitting would commit us to zygotes. Uh, well, people have sort of mixed intuitions here, but, but I think it's slightly unintuitive. Um, uh, Bush Jr. and Bush Sr. exist. Uh, well, whenever they do that, in any world where they do that, um, of course, one would be the father of the other, so there will be fathers, and, and that's sort of slightly unintuitive that Jews Bush Jr. and Bush Sr. exist should commit us to, to father. So these are just some other possibly unintuitive consequences of the modal principle. Um, so what about uh, simply taking ontological commitment just to be sort of um, short or a certain way of talking about our, our consequences in the language? Um, well, so we could say that, that so S commits us to Fs, uh, that that means that their Fs is a consequence of, of S. Um, so there are a couple of problems, at least, with that. 
Uh, one problem would be that it's hard to account for the difference between um, the trivial nature of there are Fs is a consequence of there are Fs. As that's trivial, you know, nobody would reject it. Um, whereas there are Fs commits us to the existence of Fs. I mean, that's, that's what people are debating, right? So that doesn't seem trivial. So one is trivial, the other is not. So it doesn't seem that they could mean the same thing. Um, we also might further worry about uh, what the consequence relation is. Um, well, for Quine, of course, it would probably have to be some kind of classical consequence relation, but then we run into trouble because um, the classical consequence relation, um, well, entails everything. So if you have their numbers, then that would commit us to, to uh, everything. So uh, I'm assuming that's not a viable account of, of ontological commitment. Um, so what about uh, treating ontological commitment as basic? Uh, so that's a common move. We can't find an analysis. We have the problem with the strict conditionals. And so we go basic. Um, I think that's very plausible in many cases. So if you're a presentist and you think that the tenses are, are basic, um, then, and, well, that's, as, I mean, that seems initially plausible because, I mean, we encounter tenses in ordinary language, and so presumably we have some kind of understanding, basic understanding of these terms. Do we have a basic understanding of the notion of ontological commitments? Well, that's not fully clear. I mean, it's a term of art that Quine introduced. Do we have this sufficient um, pre-theoretical or even sort of post-theoretical <laughs> understanding of this term? Um, well, I don't think we do. Uh, it might be one possible way to go. Um, but I think it would be a more convincing way if we could actually treat the notion of commit that actually occurs in ontological commitment talk the way that it's treated in ordinary language. So let's just uh, look at a little bit of ordinary uh, language, um, commitment talk in ordinary language. So what do we say in ordinary language? We say a lot of stuff, the word commit plays uh, a role in, and has various senses. So we might say John is committed to paying child support. Mary is committed to Peter. The funds are committed to a re reconstruction project. Our university is committed to being international. Um, my wife is committed to believing in me. We are committed to believing God will fulfill every promise. Uh, so these are just some of the ways that we talk about commitments in ordinary language. And so we could sort of extract um, sort of some, some rough translations of what is committed to means. Um, so it can mean like is obliged to, has promised to stay together with, is bound by contract to, is working towards the end, is bound by code X, where code X will be sort of the one that's contextually determined or relevant in the context. But of course, if we just go and plug in the ordinary language meanings for, for the commitment talk, we'll get nonsense, right? So that's not going to work. Santa is makes us obliged to Santa. Nonsense. Santa is has made us promise to stay together with Santa. Santa is binds us by contract to Santa. Santa is makes us work towards the ends. Santa. Santa is binds us by codex to Santa. Of course, that's not going to work. So I'm suggesting that if we are sort of going, trying to spell out um, this account in terms of, of ordinary language, ordinary language meaning of commit, then perhaps what we are doing, and when we talk about sentences or theories being committed to entities, perhaps we are really talking sort of elliptically. Um, and here by ellipsis, um, I'm got not going to mean ellipsis in a syntactic sense. Uh, that would be silly. Um, is sort of in an utterance sense. So uh, we, we might say Santa Claus is committed to the existence um, of, or commits us to the existence of Santa Claus. And then one way of filling in that, perhaps what we could mean would be that accepting um, Santa Claus is, commits us to believing in the existence of Santa Claus or accepting Santa Claus is requires us by codex um, to believe 